Good morning. Well, I guess good evening, good night, wherever, you know, somewhere on the globe. Uh, let's see. Adam, what's going on, man? Hey, how y'all doing? Good to, good to be on again, man. Thanks for having so, me. I was, you know, I was thinking, well, should we do like a little holiday one and all this? But people can watch it later if they would like uh, or not. Nice. Um, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about what's going on in the Cardano ecosystem, some kind of interesting things. We'll do some uh, five T's, cognitive bias, game theory recap, so that all of you get your minds right. Uh, we'll look at the markets for a second. It's the same flat it's been. I mean, it's green today, but it was the same. If you go back one week, same market. Go back three weeks, same market. Like nothing's really changed, um, which is good. This is when you can invest. Uh, okay, let me say hello to a few people. Cisco, what's going on? Let me say hello to Joe, Belinda. Hello, hello. Danny, Kelda. Me and Danny were at the beach the other day. That was fun. Blue. Demayan, Tiffany, what's going on? Okay, so we will do our little Scott. What's up, man? La misma chingadera. <laughs> um, I got a uh, I got a a rights violation thing, which this is so funny. So they took one of my videos and made it private. They said you got a rights violation. It was music that Eric, my producer on um, Money Map, that he made. Like he ma he made the music himself, and we got a rights violation for it. YouTube, YouTube, bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't win. Even when you make your own music, you violate your own rights. Michael, what's going on? Crypto Amigos, tube that pipeline. Okay. Uh, I wonder if Theta. All right. Well, if you're on Theta, say hi. All right. So let's do our little non commercial, commercial, non commercial break. We'll be right back. We'll talk Cardano. We'll see, you know, what's going on in the near term future from Text and Stakes, Stake Pool Operator. And let me see. I think I have. I think I have, I did have a card for you. Let me look at my many cards. StreamYard has so many, so many cards. All the cards. Ah, bam. Are we correct? Adam, is that correct? That, that, that's great, man. Thank you. Woo woo. Okay. So we will be right back and we will get to the guts. We'll get to the guts of this thing. And I also have a, if we have time, I have a couple of, of Doquan articles Ooh. for anybody who's Still got that little little shred of real vision hope that he's going to make something work. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> what a dick. All yeah. right. Okay, so why don't we do this? Let me put on the um, little weird little background music. Okay, Adam, I'm going to let you choose. As the guest, ooh, do we ooh. go acoustic, cinematic, dance, pop? These are all different choices. Ah. Day, daydreaming. Okay. And don't take my intonation to mean any, anything. I'm not, I'm not trying yeah. to in, infer. Yeah. Feeding the ducks. <laughs> yeah, I think I've heard that one. Into space. Lo-fi. Night driving. And rock. Let's go. Let's go into space. Ooh, Just okay. Where Luna wanted to go. This huh? is exciting. On topic. I don't know where. I don't know where it'll take us. Okay. Okay. Um. Let's see. Let me see. Uh, if we. Oh, BZ, what's going on? Jared, what up? Big corn candy. Well, hello everybody. Hello. Hello. All right, Adam. Um, let's do this real first. Let's let's not talk crypto markets let's talk uh what's going on in cardano i know that you're you're pretty close to it so first for those of you that don't know what a stake pool is can you kind of describe like like emil and jeff say as if you were speaking to a golden retriever feel free to to bark your answer if you want but what is a stake pool what is a stake pool operator and and how does that just fit into you know proof of stake People think it's just a bunch of rich guys making decisions because proof of stake. And I think that's a, well, that's obviously a flawed look at proof of stake. But how would you explain it to like 
you know, a golden retriever or maybe a, a grandmother that's just barely holding on to the seeds of reality. Oh, man. So so <laughs> I've done a lot of uh, metaphors in the past where I compare it to stock market or banking or something like that. But I'll, I'm going to try to give it a crack while staying in the realm of crypto without, you know, giving a metaphor outside of it. So, you know, basically... Um, you could say that on a scale of how decentralized you are, meaning that, you know, it's the opposite of being just ran by one central entity with one big server computer pool in a room. I've, I know I've already lost grandma, but I'll try to keep going. And, and, and the amount of different entities you can have running a protocol, running a system that are unrelated to each other the more, the less centralized you are. And we can talk about the positives of that. But to achieve that goal, you need a bunch of different, um, let's say servers, computers to run the network. And right now Cardano has over 3000 different entities known as stake pools that help run the network. And um, we're just one of 3,000. <laughs> so it, so it, let me, it, well, let me look, okay, so let me, not to cut you off, but let yeah. me, because this is a point that a lot of people miss. So these stake pools replace, these few thousand stake pools replace millions and millions of mining rigs, like in a proof of work scenario. So instead of millions of mining rigs kind of working together in mining consortiums, right, you have tons and tons of people that with a little bit of, um, computer savvy, they can just grab the software and, and you can basically spin up a stake pool. So what does that take to be a stake pool operator? What did you have to do and what does that entail? Yeah, I really like how you compare it to proof of work because I mean, Bitcoin as far as who's really mint, who's really running the show over there is just, I mean, a couple dozen different companies on thousands of rigs. But as far as hardware, it's pretty light. Um, you know, you can run it just on, on a nice computer. You can, you can get off a new egg, you know? And so there's just nothing proprietary about it where in Bitcoin, you need to buy a six and very specific type of, um, computers to be competitive, um, to, to mine Bitcoin, where in proof of stake, it's more about, um, you know, you can, you can get on and, and, and validate the network and run it from a home computer, but how many different people with their own ADA, their own uh, stake in the network will delegate to you to put votes to you to um, authorize the system. So when you're a stake pool operator, you download this software. Now, what are you actually doing? So instead of millions of computer rigs, uh, mining mining hardware, you uh, proof of stake, there are stake pools. You guys are validating and passing transactions along. So essentially all all of these distributed systems, blockchain, lattice networks, DAGs, whatever you have, they all basically find a block, send a block, validate a block. It's just the first step that's the part that's usually different, right? The finding of the block, how consensus is determined. And so when you hear consensus mechanisms, there's proof of work, proof of stake, proof of liveness, proof of history, proof of dot, dot, dot. You can have proof of almost anything. Proof of generosity. I've seen that, like proof, whatever. But it's the proof of, that's the consensus mechanism. That's how you determine what chunk of data are we going to send to the network? And then it's going to be validated by the entire network. In the case of proof of stake, what are you doing as a stake pool? You are vying for the ability to do what to to promote transactions to to say hey this is the block yeah yeah so so cardano has what's called a mempool and that's just short for memory pool and all that means is let's say as soon as you hit i want to make this transaction i want to make this swap then that gets communicated to what's called a mempool just memory pool and then basically every other stake pool is then fighting and saying putting their hand up hey I will confirm that block and and they will use multiple of those stake pools to then confirm, say, hey, yep, that swap looks good. It looks valid. This is um, done by a, um, you know, a, 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 the the user here looks legit. Basically. So in Cardano, you have you have slots and you have epics. Is that correct? Are there are there any other time distinctions in there? 
Yeah, no, uh, no. Uh, Epic, Epic is 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 the five day, is you know your 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 five day period, and that is that is the period of where, you know, you're counting all of the blocks that you minted in there that will determine the amount of rewards that you get based on how big your pool is, how many blocks you minted in, and how big your pool. Is. So a stake pool could mint a, a number of slots within that within that five day period. A slot is what a, somewhere around twenty seconds. Uh, yeah, and, and they're even they're even shorter. Than it. But yeah, it's 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 definitely significantly less than a minute. It's pretty quick. Um, so then, so now, so you're trying to win as many of those win the right to promote transactions for as many of those slots as possible, right? And yeah. then right now, a stake pool can have how many total tokens, total ADA? It, it, again, we're talking Cardano. Cardano stake pools can have, is it 64 million? No, uh, no. I think saturation is is less. It's in the 30s. Oh, do they go to 32 oh. then? 32. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. So 32 million is saturation. And then what does that mean? If, you're, if you have more than 32 million, it would behoove people to go and get another stake pool, right? Yeah. So as soon as you hit saturation, then you stop getting rewards. So... So to, to your nice comparison, when, you, when you're putting your hand up saying, hey, I'll verify that block and, and my pool will, will, will get that block. If you're saturated, then you stop getting allocated blocks that are uh, up for minting, up for being approved. And is that to is that to further decentralize and democratize the process? Is that what that is so that you couldn't get too, too giant kind of like you have in Bitcoin where you have big mining mining consortiums that win, you know, 57 percent of the blocks so that you can't have something like that? Yeah, exactly. And and I mean, and yes. And, you know, I think decentralization is on a scale where, you know, you can have banks and Visa over here. Then you have Binance right about here. <laughs> to over here. And then Cardano's done a pretty good job, maybe even one of the most decentralized platforms of having um, so many different uh, validators being a part of it. Meaning that, you know, if you tried... Even if regulation came in, and regulation tried shutting down the United States or shutting down certain countries, it would still um, live through. You know, um, and it, it'd be very, it's very regulation resistant in that regard. So tell me, okay, what are we looking at? Who cares about the price? That's not really what I'm interested in. But as we look forward, you were talking to me earlier. There's a couple of things coming. I know there's a bunch of Cardano improvement proposals that go through, I think in June, there's like SIP 31, 32, 33, 40. So these are Cardano improvement proposals, but but the wide spectrum of stuff that you were talking about, give us just an idea of what the, the near-term landscape looks like. Yeah, so all that's combined into Vassal. It's called the Vassal hard fork. And it's really, you know, and Cardano hard fork means just, I would just think about it like an improvement. When you hear a hard fork in Cardano, just hear upgrade. And I mean, uh, as users, as delegators, you have to do literally nothing. The only people that have to do anything are the dApps. And so dApps and dApp developers, the only thing that have to, once the upgrade's live, they're the only ones that have to go integrate that into their software. But anyway, with that said, so Vassal brings a lot of speed improvements. Um, it makes it makes a lot of uh, specifics on around smart contracts um, a lot easier, a lot lighter to uh, work with. So, you know, a lot of these, apparently, and according to Charles, there, there's a lot of DEXs that are waiting to go online because they they can't, and different dApps, they can't function without these type of improvements that they're looking for. Um, and it's mostly around smart contracts, around block size, around speed, or are, are, are the big ones with Vassal. And that should be, so it's, it's it'll be going on the public. So it's right now on a private testnet, go on a public testnet in a few days, and it'll be completely live June 29th. So this is happening in less than a month. Moving. And, and you know, I mean, for all of Cardano's, you know, bad uh, experience maybe two, three years ago, as far as being slow and being late, they've hit every date I've seen in the last 18 months. You know, they've been pretty on it as far as when they set a hard date, it usually looks pretty good. To me, it seems like Cardano is, and this is why I've been so interested in it from, from way back, is slow and steady, principled, and kind of uh, peer peer review everything, check everything. They're they're the opposite of, well, a lot of projects where it's just move fast and break stuff, or just simply spam the whole universe and steal. Are- yeah, I mean, move fast and break things is is good when you're building a social media platform. You know what I mean? Or you need some kind of little chat mechanism. But 
you know, it's it, it's not where you want to put a whole uh, payment layer or or you where you want to put a DID on top of a decentralized identity. We'll get into that, but you know, the the it's just such high stakes uh, for, for for what's here and what a hack can mean, what doing something wrong can mean. That in this world, it, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense, in my opinion. So let's talk. Okay, so that's kind of an interesting thing you you said. Um, so a did this is a digital identity or yeah. decentralized identity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, decentralized identity and and decentralized. Yeah, or maybe it is a digital identity. Anyway, uh, it's 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 in and I think I think this is one really cool thing that I think separates um, Cardano from what a lot of the other proof of stake platforms are doing and. I mean, to me, this goes back to Charles's original TED talk. For anyone interested in Cardano, watch that because it just sets the pace of all these other components that you see to where we can do real financing, to where somebody can in Texas, California, can um, you know put in put in some some money and really act like the bank to you know a third world country, eventually a first world country, to anybody that wants to take out a loan needs the verification behind that to do real finance and something that can actually change the world, unlike yield farming. You know what I mean? I think that's kind of right. the setup to where he's going. And Charles did this before yield farming was a thing when he saw this vision of um, what they're now calling real fi. So real finance. And so digital identities are one piece of that. So, so that, you know, rather than obviously in, in crypto, it's going to be hard to where you would just have your normal FICO score, you know, you have a 730 or something like that, so you get a loan. Here, you, you're, you're going to need other types of verification first, and the very first step to getting there is, hey, this is me, this is this is uh, my history, and this, this is where I'm lending against, and this is what I'm lending for, those, those types of things. So you were telling me earlier, there, there are already projects underway in Africa, and they're looking to onboard one to two million people with digital identities by the end of 2022. Tell, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's their goal. That was really exciting to see in the last uh, Cardano 360. So their goal is, in specifically in, in Ethiopia, teachers and students, uh, their goal is one to two million uh, to be onboard with the digital identities by the end of the year. And then at the end of 2023, their goal is five million. And so that's kind of laying that foundation layer to show that this is provable, how, how digital identities work to then showcase that uh, to the rest of the continent and the world. And then you wonder how fast, so if it, if it goes off well, you know, in Ethiopia, then you say, well, listen, they have 13, 14, 15 other contracts with governments. This kind of, this governance as a service to me is the biggest, you know, value proposition for Cardano. It's not, you know, all of this spammy NFT crap with Snoop Dogg. Yeah, that's great. Claymation Snoop Dogg. Because that's the one thing we've all we've all wished we had and, and the world just wasn't ready. And then, you know, okay, DeFi, I get it. And stable coins, I get it because eventually governance is a service. There'd be treasury functionality, right? You'd have you'd have uh governments issuing assets. But first, I think the order is first get everybody's digital identity. And then once you know who you got in your in your kind of continental you know garden then you say okay cool Me medical records school records educational records so once you've done all the recording for all those people with digital identities and you have a way a, a, a semi-permissible way for people to use that data then you have voting potentially you have lending micro lending you you have credit scoring credit origination you start to have banking functions and then Hopefully, we'll have worked out stablecoin weirdness, and there'll be uh, these, you know, these governments will be able to issue a central bank-backed asset, which I believe, other than just pure collateral or cash equivalents, that's the only way to launch a stablecoin. You, you, I don't care what anybody says. I, I haven't been shown any math where funny money equals real money, right? Where, where fake currency equals real currency. The only, the only difference is. When you have a cult-like situation and no one cares, like with Tether, where no one cares that it was a Ponzi scheme because they were still using it. And the people that were taking fake currency and making real currency out of it were using it. They were cashing in their funny money to buy Bitcoin below a thousand bucks. So they can now recapitalize it with cash because the Ponzi scheme was made good. 
right? Like it worked for them. So that's why all of a sudden they went from 2% collateral, you know, we're talking about Tether. They were 2% collateralized. Now it's over 70. They will probably be 100% because all that money they were tucking away in their back pocket in the form of Bitcoin and other assets they were buying by trading in their funny money that there was nothing behind. Well, those assets have appreciated so much that their stolen collateral is, is good. So I think Tether is going to be money good indirectly because of their Ponzi scheme. Yeah, you know, it, I mean, I, I just hear that and it would kind of relate. I, I spent a lot of years coaching and you, you, you would see these things where somebody would do the complete wrong thing and it would totally work out for them. And it would like you would have this negative reinforcement where it was really hard to get on them after they score, even though they did the wrong thing. And you just kind of like leave that one alone. And I think the same thing's true in crypto space. Sometimes, you know, they just got lucky with their timing. No, no other way about it. They ended up panning out. And now people are saying, oh, we should have never. Why? Like even somebody as smart as Lynn Alden was was talking about how 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 could you even be so negative on Tether? Like who who, who were we to question Tether? Like. What are you talking about? You're the smart one in this room. What do you mean? We to question that. Of course, question tether. They were three percent at one point. Like that's, I don't know. That it, it's weird for me to see those kind of people back in tether. I, I don't get it. Well, the, you know, Lynn is an amazing, an amazing person. Uh, definitely a, a great engineering background. Um, that being said, I, I'm not so sure. I would just take her opinion on things. Uh, with it's with with anyone in the space sometimes people kind of narrow their focus right like there's some people on real vision that are good but the other 90 percent are snakes and it it is what it is and so just be very careful obviously you're be careful what your your like cerebral inputs are okay so back to cardano so we have these upgrades coming this month we have this potential onboarding uh, digital identities in Ethiopia. Is that the only country right now rolling out that specific that specific kind of digital identity onboarding? A everything else sounded vague to where they didn't have hard dates. To me, like my ears open when I hear hard dates. Everything sounds like they're still working on it. In the works, they have people in different countries that they've posted up, you know, that are living there. And, you know, that's good. I, I guess that's the what you need before. But Ethiopia is where I heard hard numbers, hard dates, which, you know, is kind of what I'm keep my ear off for do you think this is an under promise over deliver no <laughs> no no <laughs> i no i don't i i actually think i i think if they fail by 50 percent, it's still a win meaning that if they get half a million if they really get half a million digital identities by the end of the year i i'd call that a win and they'd be they'd be so far ahead of everyone else um i think that's a win and i mean in a larger sense i see bitcoin making a lot of inroads in africa and I think that that could be a great Trojan horse where, okay, once you have a bit of money and maybe you're a little bit, you know, you're further into the crypto scene and and, and this is maybe how we want to, you know, get off the dollar, get off the yen and and um, have a bit of reserves here. And once you get to that point, then you're like, oh, wait, but what can we do with this? And once you get to the start thinking about what else can we do with this? And that's when... You need a smart contract solution to really have the type of functionality you're looking for. And I think Bitcoin in Africa, it would be is a great entryway to then getting somebody. It's a nice setup, in my opinion, potentially for somebody like Cardano a couple years down the road. Bam. OK, I will only ask you one price question. Do you think that a few months ago, well, seven months ago and change, do you think that the two to three dollar range was justified? I mean, I, to me, to me, it's it's like you have to look at. To me, I would look at prices relative to a Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, and relative to Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think it was still a little over its skis. Relative to just the, if you just look at it in more of just a market cap sense, I think it was way over its skis, you know. Um, I, it's 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 hard to just compare it in a market cap sense when you just try to value companies in, in my opinion but you know it was it was tracking about about one seventh to one eighth of the market cap of ethereum and you know even though ethereum does have more users as far as the progress they're making that just didn't seem that far off to me personally about that ratio so let me ask you this um is there you know 
when you're looking at the space right now, you know, if you rewind seven and a half, eight months, we were at the all time highs of everything, which I thought was really stupid and felt uncomfortable, felt like we were at the top of a swing. I just didn't know how high the swing would go, but I just, I just kept feeling in the back of my mind, all of this couch money, some of it's coming into the crypto space. It's not healthy. You just saw the worst, most gross behavior from the dumbest people. And again, it's that 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 negative, you know, flawed reinforcement where someone does something stupid, like in a boxing match, the dude turns around and runs, the other guy trips and hits his foot and gets knocked out. You're like, that's a new technique. Like, no, no. And so sometimes bad behavior can then be promoted. You have these kind of, you know, these kind of short term, you know, people, they they wow it up on on, on Finn Twit whatever the F that really is. And so you see, you see a lot of bad promo. And then when you tell people, Hey, this project is sketch. Like I heard it a lot in Luna. I, I was not just me. Many of us were like, Hey, Luna is a, a scam. Like it's an obvious Ponzi scheme that it is. It's just a joke. And everybody was like, I, I ain't hating these gains though. Like, right. But you know, the same thing for the people that were in Bernie Madoff's fund until 3 AM and it's all gone. I bet if you asked all those people, matter of fact, they're not here. The one they used to come in and tell us about all them gains they were making in Luna. Um, they've been pretty quiet the last three weeks. And I'm not happy that anybody lost money. That's the you know, the whole thing. What but some people need to get punished. And look, Novagrads, his his fund, Galaxy, I think they had three hundred million dollar write-off in Luna. They got nuked. Wow. Now, what will be interesting, because he was so tight with them, yeah. is to see if he was one of the whales that got secretly paid off. Right. Because right. basically, yeah. Where did the, that money go? the assumption is now there's about $3, three billion that's not super accounted for, uh, $3 billion worth of Bitcoin that first went to Gemini and then was peeled off and went to Binance. And the people at Gemini make no comment, obviously, because... I mean, they're kind of in on it. And the people at Bi CZ came out and said, we're gonna, we're gonna track this down, even though we already knew on chain it was parked, it was already parked and leaving Binance as he was making those tweets. So that's a little disingenuous. I don't know what will all come out. I know that I saw an interesting article since we're on the subject yeah. of of kind of this this quagmire that is. Let's check this out. So two things. One. Uh, anyone surprised that uh, that Terra that Terra's Fort Luna failed uh, seventy percent a day after its debut? Terra uh, revamped its blockchain ecosystem with the latest Luna token, having experienced a battering amid its market debut. Who who on earth would have thought this wouldn't just crush it? And you had people, man, they were all over like Terra too. This is the one. There were people buying in. There's probably people. That, that are here right now in this chat that did it. They bought into it, number two, pure gambling, pure whimsy. But anyway, Terra's uh, their new Luna token, which um, follows a fork from the previous chain, is down 70% one day later after being listed. First of all, major exchanges should not have listed it, That, in my opinion. Um, I agree, totally. What a, what, I mean, oh God, you know, you could just, and again, it just gets down to critical thinking and, and just a lack thereof. But anyway, trading volume dropped by more than half uh, of, of activity um, as the sell-off, the extensive sell-off at least begins to cool because, you know, everybody sold everything they had. The latest iteration of Terra Blockchain 2 is off to rocky start. You know what? I'm not going to read any more about this. You get it. It completely collapsed. It's a it's a dumpster fire. The first, Why anyone would buy into this after this guy is a fraudster. This guy is a crook. He is a criminal. He already melted basis cash. I mean, people don't even realize this. He used another name. He melted basis cash. All that money's gone. It's the same thing. And now it's coming out that, uh, and, well, let me show you this other article. Since we get it, uh, it failed. He's a failure and he's a, he's, he's a creep. All the... Terraforma Lab staff have now been subpoenaed as investigations ramp up. Uh, <laughs> this this whole thing is just, it's like, you can't make it up. So um, he, I believe Do Kwan started to, in some weird 
this is like a grasp for like anything. Like he's in quicksand. He's just reaching for anything he can. I believe his theory was maybe enough rube gamblers will come in, bid this thing up, and he could say, hey, I made everyone good if if only for a second, which, of course, not. Yeah. Uh, however, um, even though the authorities in the U.S. haven't decided what to do, there will be – I promise you there will be indictments. So and I think you brought up a great point about exchanges. I mean you, you would think even if they're just acting in their own self-interest, what – why – why would not they not think, and we're just talking a couple years down the road to avoid U.S. sanctions and regulations. Why not just step up and say, no, we made a mistake the first time. We're not doing this the second time just because we don't want to be regulated out of existence in the United States. I mean, just for their own self-interest, not even act, not even, I'm not even assuming they're acting in the best interest of their customers, just in their own self-interest. Why not say no to Terra 2.0 and quit getting beaten by the same Dude that just beat you down. Like, come on, what are you well, doing? It, that, that's a good point. I mean, I don't understand what they were, th maybe they were thinking, well, there's all these Terra people that got nuked and this is going to save them. But again, that's flawed thinking. Yeah. What you do is you say, listen, whatever, whatever happens with this 2.0, the, the exchange is going to hoover up every possible dollar and redistribute it to people that suffered losses, even though it's not their fault. If you bought Luna or you bought UST and you parked it in, in Anchor, you're a dumbass. You're a dumbass because math, math, it's not – none of this stuff was opinion. It isn't like I don't like Do Kwan because he's a mouthpiece, which he was. Or I don't like him because I don't agree. Or no, it wasn't that. It, this was all of – and it wasn't just me, man. There was a lot of people saying this was a racket. It was a scam. It was a joke. You can't – like. The math did not work. No part of the triangle pyramid worked. It was a pyramid that was not even a good one. And so everybody was calling this out. But there were six people saying, I ain't hating them gains, though. And when something's going up, everybody goes, woo, woo, we love it. Woo. And then you get nuked. And it's the same people saying, throw him in jail. No, you know what? F you. If you, if you bought into that, look, I had a client that did it. After I told him stay away, after I told him absolutely unequivocally no, he had over half a million dollars sitting in UST collecting interest. And it was just fate that Jeff and I and Emil did that show on stable coins and how saucy they are like three days before this thing melted. That was just random, by the way. We didn't have a crystal ball. It just worked out exactly weirdly correct. And that, that the morning before, when when the, when UST lost the peg by like two cents, he said, "Hey, should I get out of UST?" I was like, "You should have never been in UST, dummy." Everything out. He he saved himself about five hundred forty thousand dollars. He was two hours away from from wow. zero. Whoa. Two hours. Wow. He just listen, but wow. not everyone was so lucky. You know who was not so lucky? Galaxy and Novogratz with his stupid ass tattoo on his arm. I'm a lunatic. No, you're a dummy. You're a dummy. And this is the thing. We just, we all have to be very careful about the people we're getting our marching orders from. Yeah. And, and I mean, yeah. and how horrible people are all, all these, like, I still see uh, Remy with some tweets on talk, talking about how brain dead everyone in crypto is. It's like, bro, shouldn't he be eating a huge humble pie right now? Like, what are you talking about? Everyone else is dumb. Like, you just nuked so many people's savings account because they trusted you. They trusted oh, Remy's you. a crook. You know, you, you know, I call, you know, I called him out on on Real Vision, and they booted me off the platform. Ral Ral Pal personally booted me off the platform because I called out Remy for that Nexus Mutual insurance scam. Right. So they were in on that. Remy was, and then Ral says, "Oh, Remy's not a part of Real Vision." Oh, really? He's a co-founder. It says co-founder, Real Vision. Yeah, 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 but but he's not really a part of it. And then they nuked my account. They kicked me off. Uh, uh, I mean, good for you, man. I mean, I, I think I think you gotta you gotta call shit out when you see it. You know what I mean? He's like, just these dudes are so scammy. And you know what? They're not the ones that get punished, though. I guarantee you, they had some sweetheart ass deal from Doquan because you know he was on their board, the LFG, also. That that uh, Remy was. Remy was on the yeah. guard, yeah, and yeah. and Rao was – not only that, Rao Powell, go back, the video is very – it's very clear. He was promoting – not only promoting it, but he was telling people it was a layer one. He said 
He said, it, it's like Ethereum. It could be, it could even be an Ethereum killer. What on earth are you talking about, dummy? Yeah. Like it, he's yeah. so, he knows nothing. The dude knows nothing. And this is, this is what really bothers me. He is, uh, as far as a macroeconomics guy, Raul is, he's sharp, man. He knows his stuff. But bro, stay in your lane. Well, and how can you have any background in bonds and then come back and say 20% APY makes sense? You know what I mean? Like, how do you, how do you, there's no way you can't have a, any kind of a bond brain and then Jesus. say, this is where they get 20%. This will work out well. Huge, you know? huge alarm bells, yeah. huge alarm bells. And so when you see people, when you see people and they're constantly promoting dog stuff, don't like at first you're stepping in it, then you're eating it. And if you yeah. listen to these dudes that sell you garbage, you get what you get. And not only that, but then don't defend it. Don't don't yeah. defend it when you know it's a racket. Just be like, yeah, it's a scam. I'm yeah. riding it. Listen, I knew Bitcoin. I uh, sorry, I knew BitConnect people that were in BitConnect that were like, it's it's clearly a scam. You can't pay 1.3 percent a day. That's a scam. However, I'm gonna ride it till the wheels fall off. And I was like, well, you know, the wheels are gonna fall off because if we're talking about it, it's only days away. And I think it lasted a few months, right? Before, yeah. and it and it only hoovered up three point four billion. Everybody's like, "Oh, BitConnect, Doquan melted almost sixty billion dollars worth of poof gone." Just gone. There's gone. no telling. There's no telling how much damage he he and Real Vision and Novagrats and that whole consortium of douchebags at Binance that were. Every one of them are in on it. It's not conjecture and speculation. You can go look it up. Go look at the the, the uh, board members of the uh, Luna Foundation group. Go look them up. Remy's right there, okay. right? Go look at the video. All of these dudes were pushing it super hard. So they are responsible. And what do you think happened to all these? Because VCs are not, not always the smartest. Everybody's like, oh, VCs. That doesn't make them smart. They just have piles of money. They throw them. They push an asset up. They get out when you're getting – you are their exit liquidity. You're their dummy. You're their greater fool. So they – don't confuse them for geniuses. And they FOMO like anyone else. They FOMO'd into it. They got nuked. That's all money now. $60 billion worth of value is gone that can never be invested in the crypto space moving forward. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, any regulator that was like, oh, I've got a big play. Maybe I'll look at something else. Now it would just motivate them even further to come further into the space and also more knee jerk type of regulations and just go after all proof of stake and not know the difference between what is the difference between a Cardano, a Binance USD and a Luna. You know, I mean, it's it, it's going to take them a lot of education to get there to even regulate something that would be beneficial. And you know, it, it that's one thing that makes me scared. It's I'm more scared of the repercussions that come after it than just getting melted like that, you know. Well, I hope we get some thoughtful regulation around stable coins, but but again, Jerry and I had talked about this for a while. Stable coin again, right? There will be a regulatory crackdown on stable coins because again, that's not really crypto, is it? Stable coins ain't crypto. Yeah. It's 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 a middle ground. It's it's a holding it's it's a pool where you can hang out where the water is lukewarm between your digital asset investments and the US dollar or whatever or whatever sovereign asset you're you're stabling, right? And so it's for people that want to stay on the sidelines and don't want to go back to the dollar because of some perception of tax implications or just the weirdness of these exchanges holding dollars versus holding uh proxy dollars or quasi dollars in the form of stable coin. And so so, and I even recommend it, right? Keep keep about 10% in stablecoin because if the markets sell off precipitously and you want to jump in and enjoy it uh, and get some of those uh, wonderful discounts, you know, you have some stablecoin. I like USDC. I have never liked USDT, but who knows? I mean, USDT might be might eventually be 100%. I, I think it will eventually be fine. Not right now, but when they are forced. However, you know, three rando, you know, uh, accounting. Uh, what, what, what do they say that the three guys that did their that their statement of uh, that they have to provide a statement, I guess, to the Southern District of New York every quarter about how much you know where all the assets and collateral that are on the other side of Tether, and the, the accounting firm was like three dudes that can't be reached. None of them have phones. They're like in Panama uh, City or something. Like very sketchy uh, stuff. Yeah. So. 
oh, we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, that being said, it's kind of interesting. Um, but real quick, um, the authorities are coming after um, uh, not just not just Doquan, but apparently everybody. Prosecutors have reportedly secured a statement indicting some Terraformer Labs, uh, indicating that Terraformer Lab staff were opposed to launching UST and Luna after initial modeling failed. So think about this. Of course, everybody with math, yes, but if they did the modeling in the beginning and they realized this is a fail and they still launched it and it still hoovered up 58-ish billion dollars, not to mention the knock-on effect of seven or eight billion leaving stable coins altogether the following week, just in panic. If they knew this in the beginning, aren't they liable for some for for all of it? Yeah, I mean, and and they they at least have to hand over, and it gotta be so hard to make everyone whole, but they at least have to hand over everything that's behind UST. You know, what I mean, I, you you would like to see them you know at least sued for that for everything that's behind it because these guys sh i mean it's just criminal behavior to be able to keep any of the bitcoin that you had backing your ust and you know who knows if that'll ever come to fruition but you know that that definitely needs to be chased down and all, all the transactions all the way through of where did that bitcoin go you know? well we know we know a, a, this is this is the, the the my worry is this Okay, let me tell you what's going to happen, and then later we can say I have a crystal ball, but it's not a crystal ball. It's just like yeah. basic game theory. Yeah. We already know that the LFG did not defend the peg. We know unequivocally they did not. We know that between 1.5 and 3.2 or 3.3 billion dollars worth of Bitcoin went to Gemini and then to Binance. At that point, it gets murky, um, and I don't think – Do Kwan wants anybody to give any more detail, but it won't be his situation. It'll then be CZ, and he'll be like, oh, "I mean, it's not me, man. I, you know, I don't even know what happens. I, I'm just, I'm just a guy with a big head hiding in international waters." So he's going to get called on the carpet. the 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 Gemini twins are going to get called on the carpet because they were a part of this. Here's my worry, and also my assumption. I think some whales were made good. At, they were made whole, dollar for dollar whole. Wow. They were allowed, they got paid out, even though they had UST stuck in anchor. Because remember, you, you, your UST, if it was an anchor, you can't just pull it out. Wow. It was like a wait period to it, like a, like, what do they call thaw period? Yeah. So you couldn't get out on that day. So if you had it stuck there, you were stuck there, bro, unless that happened to be the day that you were accidentally withdrawing, right? Yeah. So with, if that's the case, if, and I'm sure it happened. Some investors were made whole dollar for dollar, even though their assets were still stuck. They got preferential treatment. Then we're going to see the little tendrils and those are going to come right into the United States. Yeah, because you, you, you remember that period when Do Kwan just went totally silent for about 48 hours on Twitter. It was right when the pegs started going down and then just 48 hours of silence of like, oh, we all need to talk this out. That, that that period right there, I think, is exactly what you're talking about when people are made whole of like, do we A, defend the peg, or B, make our buddies rich? And I'm pretty sure they went with B, you know? Yeah, and I don't even think it was make their buddies rich. I think they patriated everybody's losses. They said, listen, if this thing goes to zero, we're going to pay you out right now your your account or or a high percentage of your account in, yeah. in the, the Bitcoin that we have. And my guess is some percentage of that, th of that one and a half to three point whatever billion – some of it probably went to Galaxy because he didn't quite – because Novogratz didn't quite seem as somber as someone that just took a $300 million write-off. Yeah, and that's the thing is it can sit in his back pocket. You know what I mean? He doesn't have to claim it. or He doesn't have to claim it ever. It can just be in a wallet, and he'll just be like, well, you learn lessons the hard way. Bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if they track it, but if they can track – and they, and again, this is the problem is there's no yeah. way Binance will cooperate. There's no way. Uh, yeah, because I mean, it seems like the only one with any stick on on Gemini or Binance would be the U.S. And their only stick would would be, you know, we'll never let you work with anybody in the U any U.S. bank ever again, unless you cooperate. And still, even then, they'd probably walk. But I, I, that's the only possible. I mean, everybody will walk away from Korea. Binance and Gemini will say we're not even answering your phone calls. Yeah, you know I mean, because they wouldn't care if they lose Korea. 
Well, if let me ask you this. If Jim and I got called on the carpet, the twins, they will absolutely rat. Yeah, that's a good point. If if the Southern District of New York comes after the Gemini twins, let me anybody out there who thinks you pulled a fast one, if those two ratty snitches get called <laughs> yeah. on the carpet through a subpoena, those yeah. motherfuckers will tell everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, both those dudes in their boat shoes are just gonna fold right over. Man. <laughs> they're like the they're like the a skill a uh, a uh, 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 collapsible workbench just to just come <laughs> <Just, I'm gone. laughs> But yeah, wait, we, we didn't ask you that question. No, I'm 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 telling you anyway. I'm, I'm, they I'm will get- they will say it, and I also you know and interesting if they peeled off some of that Bitcoin at Gemini because there was a reason it went to Gemini first. Mm. So if they peeled off Bitcoin at Gemini, because remember they listed Luna, they don't even. You can't even get Cardano at Gemini, <laughs> and yet you can get Luna. Yeah, same with FTX. What a joke, man. Yeah. So those idiots are in on it, and I say idiots because I don't want to call them criminals because I don't think they're criminals. I think they're idiots, because, but it's one or the other. If you were in on Basis Cash, uh, Titan, um, same thing, Mark Cuban. Is he a criminal or an idiot? He's an idiot. He's a well-intentioned idiot. He, I don't believe Mark Cuban intends to do anyone harm. He's, he's, he is a decent dude. I've met him. I know some of his family from Dallas, whatever. He's a decent dude. I think he's a dummy, but he is a decent dude, right? The, the Winklevoss twins, I think they generally mean well. They're not Mark Zuckerberg. Understand that, right? They, they are not, I don't think criminal. They're just kind of idiots. And they will absolutely tell it. They are going to snitch on second one. And my worry, though, is if they were made good in this process. Mm. If they warehoused with some kind of special repatriation deal, some kind of Doquan handshake, that's going to get exposed. Yeah. yeah, yeah so, no. yeah, I mean, that's going to get exposed. And I guess I guess that's where I'm at. Ugh, man. This, but but these kinds of things, if that gets, if that can of worms opens up and Gemini gets exposed for pulling backhanded deals with Doquan and Galaxy did backhanded deals with that whole fund is blown up. If that, if that happens, Galaxy will unload to zero. They'll be shoot that, that fund will unload to zero because already a lot of people question like Novo and question his like motives and everything. Sure. They should. So ugh, I don't know, man, this and, and I don't like to keep drudging it up, but you have to because this stuff is important. This dictates the way we're going to get out of this messy kind of economy that we're in right now as far as the, the crypto space and and kind of move forward and, and kind of get out of the mud, so to speak. But anyway, uh, real quick to sum this up, uh, investigations, South Korean startup Terraforma Labs, the firm behind the failed stablecoin and the failed second one are ramping up led by its joint financial and securities crime investigation team. Seoul's Southern District Prosecutor's Office is now probing the firm's employees, according to local JTBC, citing Terraforma Labs employee familiar with the matter. Authorities have subpoenaed all Terraforma Labs employees, and and that includes their legal team that, by the way, they all re- they all resigned the week of the, of the, the downturn. The whole legal team resigned. So uh, they reported... Uh, last Friday, labeling it a full-scale investigation, the outlet source was said to have worked at Terraforma Labs uh, throughout initial development of the Terra. Oof, they've got an insider already blowing the whistle. But again, math blew the whistle. It's not like there's some guy inside like, this is like a deep throat, water gate. No, man. We If you had a napkin and a pen and like, <laughs> dude, okay, fake, uh, UST, anchor. Oh, you, oh, it's a scam. Anyway, Luna changed hands for around $3.30 after it was first listed on South uh, Korean Exchange Coin 1 in May 2019. After a year, uh, Luna had fallen 94% to below $0.20. Cents. Uh, it was only around three months after Terraforma Labs co-founder Do Kwon launched doomed stablecoin UST that Luna began its meteor- meteoric rise. So again, this was a taped-on scenario. UST aimed to maintain its dollar peg with an algorithm that burned Luna in exchange for UST. <laughs> The market valued Luna at eighty-five dollars to start of twenty twenty-two. Price appreciation of more than forty thousand in eighteen months. UST was meanwhile keeping its dollar peg, albeit with a few small hiccups. But UST wouldn't survive much longer. Earlier this month, the token depegged, uh, falling from one dollar to fifteen cents in less than seven days. Investor Exodus simultaneously sent Luna 
crumbling to a fraction of a penny. UST and Luna together boasted nearly 50 billion in market value before the depegging. They were worth 3 billion one week later. So it's only that's only 47 billion dollars gone. Uh, now the backdrop of Doquan's attempted revival of the ecosystem on a different blockchain with different tokens. Investigators have reportedly secured a uh, a statement claiming some Terraforma Labs insiders were opposed to launching Luna on and UST after initial modeling of the protocol ultimately failed, meaning they knew it would never work before they launched the first UST. Despite apparent employee pushback, Quan pushed to deploy the new tokens. Uh, noted JTBC, sole prosecutors are now probing whether local crypto exchanges adhered to proper listing processes for UST and Luna, as well as potential price manipulation. Now, this is something that all of these exchanges, I think, are going to have to answer, and that we talked about earlier. Why did you list even the first look? Why would you list this coin? Do you have no one at your exchange that does any due diligence at all? Is there no one at any of these exchanges that does any flipping math? No math? There's no math at the exchanges? I just find that hard to believe. While officials uh, and, and investigators play out um, their um, investigation, 76 victims have filed complaints with the prosecutor's office against Quan and Terraformer Labs co-founder Shin Hyun Sung. In total, these complaints are tied to losses worth 6.7 billion won, 5.4 million. Oh, that's tiny. So, so this is just a tiny group. This is, but it becomes a class, and once it classes up, everyone's gonna pile on. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna get ugly. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. I, 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 I guess I'll just, I hope that it comes from the positive. You know, maybe there can be some guidelines for exchanges on listings that can come out of this. You know, like, you know, do you who, who's your group? How decentralized are you? Is it just one guy pulling the strings? How? How do you get your APY? You know, those should be some good questions and maybe some guidelines for these for the Wild West. You know, so let's do this. Let's take let's take a look at the markets, and you tell me. I mean, everybody knows what I think is interesting. Is there anything you find interesting going on? Uh, I like I like I like I like the Matic play. I know you're big on it too, but I like the Matic play really as maybe the biggest winner of Ethereum falling on their face. You know what I mean? I it, it I if if they push 2.0 out 2.0 out in August, I think that'll be way rushed. Um, I know a lot of those a lot of the community likes Polygon and Matic. You know, um, low fees. I, I think there's I think that is where a lot of the ETH community um, would head in in my in in my estimation. And so I think just just playing Ethereum failing to come out with anything that significantly improves their protocol in the next six months if that's how i would you know show that bet i think too people don't realize and and we won't get off into a whole thing but that the merge doesn't solve the fee problem all the the merge simply creates proof of stake it just moves the fees from the miners to the staking val to the validating nodes but it doesn't improve the fees any now, what's improved the fees lately is because no one's buying or selling anything on Ethereum because the markets have gotten quiet. Most of the dummies have left and the NFT market has swelled to something very small. And again, yeah, there's still coins that are, that, you know, sorry, tokens, NFT assets that have really high valuations because it's a small handful of assets being traded by a very handful, a small handful of rich individuals but that's basically it. There's not a lot of new money pouring into the NFT space. Now, there is a lot of interesting innovation, and I think we will see uh, the the worldifying of NFTs, your concert tickets, your paper documents, your legal documents, all this kind of stuff. I think that's the future of the NFT space, and I think that's all sitting on infrastructure rails, which gets us back to plays like Polygon and things like that, where you say, listen, you know, I've got a chance to participate Polygon's got some cool stuff. So they got the deal uh, with eBay. They got, and, and eBay was working with Tezos and then Switch. They said, we're not, we don't not like Tezos. We just more like Polygon. Yeah. They got the deal with Instagram, which they're testing right now. None of those, none of those have rolled out, but I mean, that's got to be massive, right? Huge. 
So just just those two. And then there was one other thing that they did. Oh, gosh, I'd have to go back through the notes. There's something I saw late last night when I was looking at the news because I, I look at the crypto news all the time. And there was one article about some other partnership that was burgeoning between Matic. Um, again, so, man, I, I think it's a good play. I think it's, you know, it, it's definitely no longer just a layer two to scale Ethereum. Yeah. It's right. become a legitimate, in my opinion, it's a layer one. Do you think it's a layer one? I mean, it, 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 it behaves as, as a layer one. You know, I mean, they've they've separated themselves from the validation of the fees of Ethereum. So, you know, I, I think it's I, I think it's where not only. Yeah, like you say, not only people, but companies. I mean, you can't if if Ethereum had the fees that Matic has, I think eBay would be doing the deals with Ethereum, you know, and I think they're I think they're looking at the next choice of how somebody would advise them to kind of go down the rabbit hole that would be a, a Ethereum centric, you know, would, would be to go to Matic. So let me ask you one final question and then we'll wrap it up and let yeah. people enjoy their holiday. <laughs> final ahead. question would be, I pose this to you. Do you think the hype around the Ethereum merge coming August, September, whatever, do you think that's a catalyst to get people back in a more bullish kind of mindset? Do you think that that gets us out of the doldrums or do you think it's kind of one among many, you have the Cardano ecosystem upgrades, you have a lot of deals going on with Matic. Like what, what do you think? Or matter of fact, maybe I'll make it simpler. Do you yeah. see anything on the horizon that, that gets the mindset of the aggregate retail investor more excited about the crypto space? Oh, Oh, beyond Ethereum. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I don't know, they, but but I, I, w I would definitely like to see, I think, more real solutions, you know, like, for example, this is a small deal, but the deal, you know, Cardano did with Dish just will just inject NFTs into all these users that are Dish network users. But in the same kind of way that you're talking about, Nick, where there's something usable, like just your receipts are an NFT or just your subscriptions can can be more verifiable and, and done on that type of system um, or to where, you know, you, you go on eBay and you buy your favorite Adidas shoes and you get an Adidas NFT. You know, I think something like that can maybe be that six month horizon type of exciting. But, you know, I think the two year horizon is more like a real five play where you can do actual finance uh, through crypto protocols. OK, and then finally, uh, I'm just going to do a quick two minutes, two minutes of critical thinking, five T's and cognitive bias. Bam. Critical thinking. Everybody should listen. If you do, you can crap can the whole rest of the video if you want and just write these things down. They need to be behind your thinking in the crypto space. And it is. You need to be a critical thinker. Well, in life, right? Not just in crypto, but in life. Um, and see, so these are skills we all need. We need to be able to analyze the situation. We need to be able to communicate our thoughts. And I would say ask questions, right? One of the one of the things that separates smart people from really smart people is we have questions. Can you take those kind of nebulous questions, those abstract ideas, and reduce it to a question you can ask a person, a, an entity, or a Google? Like you have to reduce your thoughts to a question you can ask. So that's part of communication and analysis. You need to be open-minded. Be open to being wrong. It's okay to be wrong. Matter of fact, you want to be wrong sooner than later. Because the sooner you're wrong, then you can kind of you can make an adjustment, a course correction, and then you can move forward in a way that's not so wrong. Uh, problem solving, again, the ability to ask questions, and, and it's kind of embedded in all of these analysis, communication, open mindedness, problem solving skills, and creativity. Right? Why did they get six year olds to draw pictures of spaceships? Because sometimes after you've been after you spent 19 years in astrophysics and particle physics and and, and you know, uh, space, interstellar travel, re you, you get grounded. They basically, your creativity is eroded away and you think within a very specific box. Your, your, your thought process has been, you know, compartmentalized to only the things that the people around you say are possible. Mm. But when you don't have those constraints, you think of all sorts of cool stuff. And so little kids without all this, without all the things that you're not allowed to do or you can't do, Sometimes they're quite innovative. Um, Love it. The five T's. Um, and so this is what we kind of look at. Um, you go, okay, what is the problem? 
that that this company is trying to solve. But it all boils down to um, the team, the technology, the tokenomics, the timing, and then why does the token exist? And that's where you say, why does the token exist? What is the problem they're trying to solve? And and, and does it violate like the rules of physics and engineering? Right? If you if if the answer is they're gonna solve time travel or you know uh, beat the speed of light, uh, or so, you know you want to go away from it. If you have to violate the laws of physics for your thing to launch, do not invest in that thing. That is a bad thing. Okay, uh, and then finally, if I was to if I was just to you know to kind of dig into that deeper, it means basically cash, which is your runway value. Why do they exist? Direction. Look at the management team. Price. Is it priced? Is it priced as valued or undervalued? That's a personal decision you have to make. Liquidity, can you enter and exit the position? Because that's important if you want to get out, if you've made some currency units and you want to swap out. Um, and then is there any meat left on the bone, right? And that that all to me is part of the five T's, but it's if you were to go a little bit deeper, that's part of like really deciding on your investment decision, the nitty gritty. Once you've decided on a token, that makes sense, fits in your portfolio, then you would say, okay, cool. Cash value, direction, price, liquidity, and meat left on the bone. All right, uh, real quick on cognitive bias. These are the tendencies to think in certain ways that lead us to systematic deviations from a standard of rationality or sound judgment. It's, all, it's like we are all nature versus nurture and a little bit of self-evolution, right? I, I imagine we're all changing a little bit all the time. But there are just the ways we were raised culturally, there's significant, you know, moments in our lives and, and things that shape our thinking and our biases. And you have to understand that we all have these cognitive biases and they, they are present, but you can't let them lead you to these deviations in rational thinking, you know? So always think, think about thinking, especially today when you're like, you're not going to do a lot of stuff. You have some time to be on your own or with your family, whatever. Think about actually thinking. How do I think? How do I arrive at conclusions? Do I make systematic deviations because of my childhood and like I grew up in South Texas and the rebel flag and all this kind of stuff? That kind of, you know, how you grew up, it influences your thinking. Don't let it influence your potential, you know, I'm not going to tell anyone how to live, but don't let it get in the way of making more currency units, I guess is what I would say to that. And then uh, just a final look at game theory, and that is the study of the mathematical models of the strategic interaction between rational decision makers. It has applications in all fields of social science as well as logic and computer science and, and uh, economics. But again, and this is the key, it's the mathematical models, which are means math is important, of the interactions between rational decision makers, person A and person B, Think, imagine two people in a, in a very, in a thin tunnel, they have to walk by each other, but there's not quite enough space. How are they going to pass each other? What, what are the incentives? So th these are, these are things, you know, I think the five T's is a good way to be a critical thinker in the crypto space. I think being a critical thinker is a good way to be a human. And I think game theory makes all of that kind of mesh together. Final thoughts, Adam, final thoughts on that. Man, those are some great gems for for people that stay to the end. Uh, you know, I, I think I think you know that's the improving your thinking is the core of improving your decision making, which is what I think is the biggest uh, thing to help get you rich, right? I mean, I, I, I think I think that's great. And I mean, I guess the last is you know uh, Memorial Day. So you know, thanks to everyone that served. Thank you, Nick, and everyone out there. And if everyone enjoys enjoys their Memorial Day, enjoys their day off. Adam, if they if people want to check out your stake pool, what would they have to do if they want to stake with you? Where are you guys at right now in stake? Yeah, we're at uh, so a pledge of uh, over six hundred thousand ADA and a delegation of about one point one million ADA. Oh, nice! So you got a nice little bag. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I mean, of how big it's gotten, it's still considered a very small pool, but uh, we're we're still chugging along. So so it's good and one hundred percent uptime. And uh, another thing that when you're analyzing pools is look at the variable fee and we're at half a percent. So I think pretty competitive uh, there. So yeah. Nice. Yeah, and, and yeah. <laughs> so, and then they can catch you on Twitter as well at uh, Adam C 2 D. Yeah. 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 I've been, been a little more active on, on Twitter lately and with all the Cardano projects, it's been more engaging for, for me as well. So 
um, yeah, get, can always catch me there and I'll, I'll follow you back and build a, build a nice community over here. Bam. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of your holiday weekend. Uh, stay out of trouble. Stay in school. Don't do drugs. Don't do anything my poor insolvent drunk starting on meth or Adam wouldn't do, which, as you know, is very little. We'll see you on the next one. 